The publisher of the New York Times wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post decrying the threat to the independent press in democratic countries. I'm Scott Ott with Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, and this episode of Right Angle is brought to you by the members at BillWhittle.com. Gentlemen, I thought it was unusual. I usually don't read the opinion page in the Washington Post, but when I saw that the publisher of the New York Times was writing an op-ed in basically their major competitor for national and international news, I thought, this is interesting. It is a very long piece, and one wonders why it wasn't simply written as a news story, since much of it contains uh, purported facts. But A.G. Sulzberger, who was the heir to the heir to the heir to the New York Times uh, dynasty and publisher, um, writes this op-ed basically starting off with an imaginary scenario where a democratically elected president of a country begins using the levers of government to crack down on independent journalists with whom he disagrees or who have critical opinions of him. And it goes on for paragraph after paragraph describing the scenario, clearly wanting to conjure the prospect of Donald Trump becoming president and then cracking down on the fake news. Um, well into the story, you find out that no, in fact, this is about Viktor Orban from uh, Hungary and what he has done, according to Sulzberger, to the press there. And then he also uses examples of Modi's government in India and Bolsonaro's government in uh, Brazil, the former president of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, and how democracies can use um, less oppressive tactics than an autocracy might, for example, by uh, digging into tax records, by, uh, l by fiddling with immigration laws to affect the lives of reporters and editors at these publications, um, and by uh, having their well-to-do associates file lawsuits against news organizations. And Sulzberger is very concerned about this, Stephen Green. Um, clearly, even though he says later in the story that he has no political favorites and, and he wants to, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll read you that paragraph well, in a bit. Well, if, if this whole thing was just a setup for that joke, man, Sulzberger really hooked you. Yeah. So, but he's basically, <laughs> he, he is expressing concern. But what struck me, Steve, about the whole thing, it, at no point in the story, in, the, in this op-ed, did Sulzberger acknowledge any possibility that anyone might have a legitimate gripe against the media. Um, now, I, I would agree with him that we shouldn't be using, you know, tax laws, immigration laws, or the courts to to crack down on so-called freedom of the press. Uh, but it seems like he really thinks, Steve, that we have independent journalism in this country, that we have an absolutely free press, and that we need to stand up and defend them against the onslaught of, you know, the IRS or or the immigration uh, or ICE or or the courts. Um, Steve, do you think we have such a problem? And if you don't, why would the New York Times publisher publish something in the enemy newspaper to decry it? Well, we do have a free press. The problem is they just don't act like it. You know, it's it's like you you take the you take the the dog that's been chained up in the yard for its entire life, and you you, you finally take the chain off the thing, and it, all it does is stay put right where mm. it was. Well, our press has never been chained by the government. We've had freedom of the press since day one in this country, and yet our press. I I started calling them this week over at PJ Media, our state steno pool, and. They have voluntarily put on the shackles and they stay right in their in their place in the yard and they and the worst part is they bark at anybody, they try and scare away anybody who's actually taking advantage of that freedom. And I'm talking here about Elon Musk and, and X, formerly known as Twitter. God help us. You know, our 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 state steno pool, they will go after anybody who actually promotes the freedom that they are supposed to be not just exercising but protecting for the rest of us uh it's it's really a sad state what i find interesting about this op-ed because it brings me back to something we have talked about many many times over the years and that is this idea that oh true communism has never been tried well true communism can't be tried because once you set up yeah. these these massive level levers of power attached to these 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 huge wheels and cogs and that just can crush people absolutely it doesn't matter 
If your intentions were good, although they probably weren't, if you set up some sort of giant man-crushing machinery, it doesn't matter if your intentions were good because somebody worse than you is going to come along and take control of those levers of power. The only solution is to keep government, especially the national government, as, as small and confined as it can possibly be and yet still operate in its essential functions. And that's what our founders in this country understood so very, very well. So if Salzberger is worried about this kind of stuff, and I think maybe he is genuinely concerned, although he's got some pretty serious blinders on about where the real problem lies, but if his concern is genuine, then maybe it's up to us to do something in our small way to help remove those blinders and show him that the problem isn't that bad people are manipulating these levers of power. The problem is that the press helped to create these levers of power and that they've got to be disassembled. Bill Whittle, uh, Sulzberger's basic case is that um, in a democracy, the government doesn't really need to crack down on the press in the same way that you would with like disappearances of people or killings of journalists or, you know, shutting down or taking over and making in, into state run entities, uh, independent entities, independent news organizations, because uh, basically, <laughs> he doesn't say it exactly this way, but the, the implication is this. Uh, it's really hard to make money in journalism to begin with, and most news enterprises don't have a lot of spare cash laying around to be able to defend themselves uh, against uh, what they would consider to be frivolous lawsuits against them or regulatory actions or tax actions or whatever. So he's basically saying you can you can throw a brushback pitch from a democratic form of government even by threatening to do such things or suggesting that the IRS may take a hard look at the books of the Washington Post or the New York Times, for example. And uh, he acknowledges that all presidents, Bill, have had a, a fraught relationship with the media. Even Joe Biden, who claimed that he believed in freedom of the press, but then did everything he could to avoid scrutiny by the press, or they didn't, he didn't say this, but Kamala Harris, you know, who dodged most interviews. Um, but he says this, uh, but Trump is an extraordinarily aggressive opponent of independent journalism. <laughs> Nevertheless, Sulzberger says that the New York Times is preparing, no matter who gets elected, he said, preparing for such intimidation tactics to be able to defend themselves. Um, and then he says this, and this is a quote, through it all, treating the journalistic imperative to promote truth and understanding as a North Star while refusing to be baited into opposing or championing any particular side. Bill, I think he probably could have written a, a credible op-ed had he left out sentences such as that and even acknowledged in a cursory manner that journalists are doing the best they can but are beleaguered by their own biases like everybody else is. Or, or is it just not possible to do that? Well, that last line sounds like it should have been delivered by Jimmy Stewart in 1939 in a Frank Capra movie. You know, this <laughs> right. is this is their vision of themselves, yeah. right? This that they are that the that the journalist corps is uh, is an uncorruptible force of people who only seek the truth. They're not a, they're they're completely immune to human foibles and weaknesses, and and therein lies the source of much mischief. Um, before I get to the, the the heart of it, let me just say this about the difference between. Um, uh, intimidation in a free society and a totalitarian society. You can talk about brushback pitches all you want to. Having finished Empire of Terror uh, seven, eight months ago on the history of the Soviet Union, I can tell you that um, the three of us are in the political commentary uh, field. I've had more tax um, audits than the average bear, but I'm not saying those two things are, are related. But I am saying this. Uh, there are things that... Um, I speak my mind in a free society without fear of the consequences. Uh, if if instead of uh, people calling me mean names or suppressing my uh, views on an, on a YouTube algorithm, if, in, if if instead of that I was being taken into the dungeon of the Lubyanka and had my hands placed in boiling water for eight minutes and having the skin peeled off to make what they called bourgeois gloves, I think in terms of overall intimidation, I'm going to go with the free society as being a cons considerably better work environment for people who are trying to report on the truth. And to compare the two is, I think, fundamentally disgusting and, and indicative of the larger problem, which I'll just get to right now. The problem with the press, Scott, is that is that like any other uh, group 
of um, of professionals or or tradesmen. They they know a lot about one thing, and that makes them think they know a lot about a bunch of other things too. Yeah. And it's not a problem when auto mechanics get together and kind of look at you like <laughs> sprocket. I think you mean socket. But but when the people that control the information have become a priesthood who only talk to each other, who only share the same opinions about everything, and who are convinced that they alone have have the uh, unbiased perspective to enlighten the masses, you get into the kind of situation where you, you've lost the essence of the republic because they're the watchdog of the republic. The danger to the republic is that the politicians will come under the mistaken impression that the people work for them. It's the job of the press to remind them that this isn't the case. But if the press then becomes as elitist and hidebound and echo chambered as the government is, you get what we've got today, which is, I don't want to even call it a unit party. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a unit philosophy. It's, it's the full, it's the, it's the elitist moral philosophical and ethical structure. The people who are the elitists in the media believe the same thing that the elitists in the government believe. They use the uh, fig leaf of this is for the greater good of those poor unwashed idiots out there who can't make up their own minds. Thank God there's smart people like us who went to fine colleges to be able to provide them with the information that they need in such a way that they'll make the right decisions and so on and so on and so on and down and down the rabbit hole you go. The thing that's so amazing to me about elitists is, is that elitists are the only people in the world that I've ever encountered, intellectuals and elitists like, like most of the members of the press corps and, and the government elites, is the only people in the world who are stupid enough to believe that a handful of people is smarter than 330 million other people about everything. You've got to be remarkably stupid to believe that you're smarter than everybody else, and in everything. That's, a, that's an astonishingly stupid thing to believe. And it is rampant in, in the press corps. So they can get up there and virtue signal all they want to, but you really get, you really, really get the, the, the best flavor of this particular stench when you start hearing journalists talking about things like, journalists should be licensed. <laughs> that you have to have a license to be a journalist. You have to pass a certain test and you have to have certain professional standards because that way you keep out all the unlicensed hairdressers who are doing a damn good job mm. without having gone to a particular cos uh, you know, cosmetology school. And you lock the door behind you once you're inside. And that's what this sounds like to me. Throughout this piece by A.G. Sulzberger, the publisher of the New York Times, um, he used the phrase independent journalism. And I was reminded of uh, The Princess Bride, and I just wanted to say, you keep using that word. <laughs> I do not think it means what you think it means. Uh, because honestly, I subscribe to The New York Times and I subscribe uh, to The Washington Post, among other news entities. The reason why I subscribe to The Times and The Post and listen to NPR is so that I know what non-conservatives are thinking. So this is so, so I can better understand people who do not agree with me. Uh, it's a great intelligence resource for me. So it's like, my, it's like the president's daily briefing on intel of what our enemies are doing. I enjoy it for that purpose. And so to suggest that somehow there's this independent uh, journalism out there that is unbound by any political obligations or proclivities is, just seemed fanciful to me. I, I will narrow it down to, to one little example here. I've seen a lot of videos on YouTube uh, headlines purporting to offer me how Peter Ducey of Fox News got into a tangle with Karine Jean-Pierre, the White House press secretary at the Daily News briefing in the White House. I cannot remember seeing any that talked about how the MSNBC White House correspondent got into a tangle with the White House press secretary yeah. at the Daily News briefing. If the independent journalists, as A.G. Sulzberger calls them, were doing their job, and if they were doing what he says they're doing, which is holding public officials to account for their actions, words, and official acts, then there would be more of that. 
it wouldn't just be all Fox News tangling with the White House. They'd all be tangling with the White House. So I, I would suggest that uh, a, a better editor at the Washington Post would have thrown this op-ed back to the publisher of the New York Times and asked him to rework it, perhaps injecting a little more independent journalism. For Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, my name is Scott Ott. Thanks to the members at BillWhittle.com for making Right Angle possible.